Hi everyone. So um, I wanted to start by, so you know, I'm Heidi, I work grassroots. Can I just get a, a show of hands in terms of um, how many people have been to there or know of grassroots? Okay, I've got fans in, great. So um, I've been um, asked here today to um, talk a little bit, a bit about the end, and um, I'm going to cheat a little bit and say uh, it depends on the context. So, as Alana said earlier on, and a lot of commentations, when we talk about life journeys and um, my personal story, um, I think, yeah, end has an end connotation, and I prefer to think of it as life stages because I've moved around so many times, had quite a few different professions, um, moved to cities internationally seven times with a family, had three kids on three kids on three different continents. And all of those experiences, I think, um, find a place um, in my present life. However, when we're talking about food sustainability, um, I do think end has the, uh, the traditional sense. In the traditional sense, um, I think we're at the end of an era of ignorance of the food's impact on human and plant health and animal welfare. So, just want to plant those seeds in your mind as we go through the talk. Um, I want to start at the beginning. Um, I was born in London and I uh, grew up around the UK. Um, by the time I finished my photography degree, I was uh, less good to leave and go travelling. Uh, working at my parents' Chinese takeaway was not the most glamorous thing to do. Um, my clothes smell, I was standing all day, I was along. So I, do, I did what a lot of uh, Brits do. You, I took the TAFL. Uh, do you know what the TAFL is? Teaching <coughs> English as a foreign language. And it was fantastic because it gave me the chance to travel and the two great years in Rome. Um, great memory from there is teaching the Italian Disease Force, so it was just a riot. And the other four years um, I spent in Tokyo, and in Tokyo is where I met my um, husband. And um, by that time, oh, I wanted to just bring up an experience in Tokyo because I, at one point I found myself um, teaching 70 adolescent school boys and girls who really did not want to be there, and I had to teach them over a sustained period of time, about 10 weeks actually. And that experience has, um, sort of reminded me that you can do these kind of things, these kind of standing in front of audiences. So it's just a reminder of how the past can sort of inspire you to do something today. And um, that's why I've got the courage to come and speak to you about my experiences today. So I thought, uh, four years in Tokyo, we had an opportunity to move to Hong Kong. And about this time I'm thinking, I really need to rethink my career because I don't want to teach anymore. I've stopped growing and learning. I'd really like to, um, Start something else. So I thought about what I studied in photography, but of course I've been six years out um, of, of that space. The only thing I could do was retrain. By the time I got to Hong Kong, I took a whole load of night courses, including Flash. Some of you probably too young to know Flash, but all of the Adobe um, software as it's known today. I took all those classes, and I landed a job at British Council in Hong Kong doing. Um, web graphic design as their webmaster and e-marketing. So a really good experience, but very hard slog to get there and you didn't give up. After three great years um, there, we had an opportunity to move to Boston um, with my husband's job. I'm a literal embodiment of the expression training spouse of done all of this because of my family. However, um, in Boston, Boston, um, I again, I was thinking about my career, what could I do? I had, we had a second child by then and um, very hard to sort of find purpose or not. I didn't want to just be a mother. I, I know a lot of people are happy doing that, but for me, it was, it, I needed to find something else. So I uh, teamed up with a friend of mine I met there, and we um, created this app, an iPhone app. By then, it was iPhone 3, so a long time ago, and we did this app for Chinese for Munchkins together. It was a really good opportunity to marry my skills in teaching and pedagogy, with, um, with graphic design, user experience, web design, and marketing. So that was pretty really fun. We didn't make much money, but we broke even, and making money wasn't the purpose, really. It was more to find purpose in our lives and to do something different. And the inspiration for this really came from my children because they were experts at um, the iPad by them, two and four year old. And um, also, we found that there was a gap in the market for learning Chinese. So going back to um, where are we? We're, so we have uh, oh, Boston is, was really um, an important time for me because it was there where I became interested in food policy and how I'm working in this space right now. A friend of mine said to me, 
you know, you really ought to read the food labels on, on, the, on the food because they inject the cows with growth hormones. And I remember feeling a sense of shock and of injustice a little bit. So sort of, why is the government not protecting me against this? Why are corporates allowed to just go and wild, you know, just for the sake of yields and profit? So that really got me thinking, and I started digging, digging, digging deeper. Um, and every time I looked, there were always cheaper alternatives for ingredients, for example, sugar and high fructose corn syrup. It was in about 75% of the ingredients I read once in the supermarket. So it got very continued um, being very interested in the topic. Another thing you learn is uh, when you travel a lot, you realize that standards are different from country to country. And I found this with the organic labeling. I think it's just slide from a colleague of mine. But you get the idea. Every country has its own standards. So this was also a shock, but more energy for me and realizing this is an area I really wanted to work in. By now, we. Um, we get an opportunity to move again, and it's Amsterdam. We have our third child, three kids on three continents. So we say it's time to stop. So, so nothing much to report on Amsterdam except that it's a fantastic city, and it's very easy to live green there. So another point I want to make about living sustainably, your environment really has an impact on how green you can be. You know, the barriers are hard. I'm sure some of you have lived abroad, so coming to Hong Kong, you might have found it difficult just trying to recycle your food. So. Um, um, and then we went from there, we went to uh, Brussels, and it was in Brussels where I really I took the leap to do a master's in food policy. I found a great program in London, and they had a distance learning option, which is fantastic, because I just had an inkling that we might be moving again. So I took this option to do um, the two-year program under the eminent professor uh, Tim Lang. And by the time um, we started it in Brussels, and I finished it in Amsterdam. By the time I finished it in Amsterdam, I thought, oh gosh, I must be ready to work and ready for employment. But of course, that was just, how wrong was I? Um, I didn't speak any Dutch, or very badly anyway, and I didn't have any recent work experience. So this was tough. So I thought to myself, what am I going to do? I thought, I thought these would be great after you know, completing a master's. So I do what I do best. I keep studying, keep learning. And I found myself taking a, a postgrad at um, London UCL in uh, research methods. I thought this time, this is a great topic, this is a great subject, because I can use it in many different disciplines that won't be tied just to food policy. And um, I do I get a distinction in it, and I find myself really interested in inspired to go on to do a PhD. And the topic in well, the topic I found was in chefs um, and encouraging chefs and businesses to um, help uh, increase the uptake of plant-based diets. So I'm really excited to start looking for grant funding. Um, but lo and behold, my husband gets an offer to come to Hong Kong, and here we are today. Uh, one of the good things about this, though, um, is that whilst I did do some freelance work in London, a colleague of mine, Simon at Forum Future, had said. You know, if you move to Hong Kong, you really have to get in touch with Peng Chan. She's a real deal. She's been doing sustainability for a long time. So get in touch with her. And so thankfully, finally, after, uh, well, after five interviews, and um, some of them really bad experiences, but on the fifth, um, not five interviews, five uh, job interviews, well, Peggy was the fifth person I got in touch with. And the timing was right. She was expanding, and I really needed a job. And that is sort of where, short, Offshore, but that's how I am here today. So right now, I would like to, in true teacher style, get a little bit interactive here and ask you this question: What does eating sustainably mean to you? And if you don't mind, would you take out your phones and take a picture of this QR code to answer the question? And so it just gives us a sense of what people in the room think of this concept. Because it's relatively new, the sustainable um, diet to be sustainable. So a browser will pop up, and you can just ask the question. And we can see, Alana's going to post, um, yeah, because everyone's taking a picture, she's going to put the poll up, and we can see, through live polling, what your answers are. Don't worry if you, um, uh, you can also type it in if you're not able to. Um... Don't 
the rocks. Okay, let's move to the image because it's quite fun to watch the numbers in it as well. So it looks like, I don't know if I've been biased here through my presentation, it looks like a lot of you are saying the planet. And a few are saying it's about high plant based ingredients. So good for the planet seems to be the leading answer here. Have had you all voted? Still got some numbers. Well, that, that's great. Um, so let me tell you, according to um, Professor Tim Lang and, and Hannah Mason, their framework around sustainable diets, it's all of those things and much, much more, in fact. So let's move back to the slides. Um, I just want to go back a step and look at the big picture around the food systems uh, very, very quickly, because you've probably seen a lot of the stats. <laughs> Uh, so you may know, or you may not know, uh, 795 million people go hungry every day, whilst at the very same time you've got 2.1 billion struggling with overweight and obesity. So you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure that there's something broken in the food system. Um, we have challenges around accessibility, availability and access. You've also got species going extinct and of course uh, climate change, so food system issues are exacerbated by uh, climate change. And to dig a little bit deeper, food is responsible for 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, while half of those are coming from livestock, almost half. Um, so to put that into context, that means all of the world's global um, transport system emissions. So that, that is quite a lot. And then if we talk about food, lot, food loss and food waste, a third of our food is wasted. So it's lost at the farm end, and then wasted during the consumption end. And on the issue of biodiversity, did you know that there are 30,000 edible plants uh, that we could eat, but we only eat 150 to 200 of them? And our calories, 60% of our calories come from only four crops. So rice, maize, wheat, and potato. So you're probably thinking right now, so what? Well, if we only derive our nutrients from so few crops, you know, we're really missing out on what the other, the rest of the nutrients that we could be having for our bodies, but also the soil, it's detrimental to the soil if you're constantly monocropping. And that's just the basics. I'm really giving you just an overview. It really is quite complex. Soil, carbon sequestration, and all, all of the rest of it. And if we dig a bit deeper when it comes to you and your plate, every time you eat, there are issues around forced labor, food waste, as we said earlier on, disposable packaging. Many of you probably had a delivery. I'm shocked every time you see that if you have, um, especially with the noodle dishes, that they're delivered with a tiny little plastic cup, just for the sake of one teaspoon of the sauce. It's astonishing that this is the norm. So there's lots and lots of work to do. Um, we're gonna show a little clip uh, it's a two-minute clip uh, that sort of puts it more succinctly than I can, um, just about the challenges and the solutions. You know the saying, you are what you eat, but the way we currently eat is in fact ruining our health, the health of others, and that's the planet. Unhealthy food is now deadlier than alcohol, drug, and tobacco use combined. 2.1 billion people are overweight, yet we eat more sugar, fat, and red meat than ever. Still, 821 million go to bed hungry every night. On top of that, our food is the main cause behind species extinction and the third all global greenhouse gas emissions. So, can we feed a growing population without destroying the planet and ourselves? Science had no clear answer to this question. That's why we need to gather 37 of the world's best scientists to determine what a healthy and sustainable diet is and how to get there. The result is the Eat Nazi Commission, a scientific movement for a healthy and sustainable future. If we change the way we produce, consume, transport, and waste food, we can feed everyone a healthy diet while improving the health of our planet. What does this look like? Meat can stay on our plate, but plants need to be the new main course. We should eat a huge variety of fruits and vegetables, and a low amount of meat, dairy, and seafood. We should choose unsaturated fats and 
stay away from refined grains, highly processed foods, and added sugars. And we have no food to waste. It will take huge changes, but following this plan will lower our risk of cancer, strokes, and diabetes. It could help avoid 11 million health deaths per year. In fact, consuming and producing food more efficiently and more free will help to keep our planet flourishing. We have an answer now. We know the right calls for a better future. It's on us to actually take that step. Our food can be the key to solving the biggest challenges we face. Food really can fix it. Okay, so there you have it, a lot of facts. Um, so now, by now you're thinking, who's doing what? Is anything being done about it? Well, the good news is there are lots of organizations around the world um, um, taking and finding solutions. And um, basically, what we need to do is we need to relearn how to produce, eat, and waste food. These organizations, the reason I say we're at the end of an era of ignorance is because there is so much science out there, so much evidence-based science, and you literally can't ignore it. So for example, um, Forum for the Future, uh, I did some work with last year, uh, they have a, a wonderful program uh, called, called the Protein Challenge 2040, and they work with businesses across the table to find um, solutions to system, uh, food system issues. For example, they've been looking at animal feed. You know, who, when you tuck into a steak, do you think about the food that the animal ate before it got to you? Probably not. So they highlight issues like this that are, that are invisible to us which is great. And the WRI, World, Resource, World Resources Institute, they've been working on research around uh, menu design, and they found that 56% um, of people are less likely to choose um, a plant-forward dish if it's in the vegetarian section. So there's a lot of you know, behavioral science going on, and, and it's really helpful, especially for people like us working in the food industry, how we can help to shift people towards plant-based diets. Not preach, not judge, but just kind of normalize it and say we can move sort of in this direction. Um, some other great um, projects, well, you know about the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, signed by 195 world leaders around the world, and then we had the Paris Climate Agreements in the same year. So there are tons and tons of things going on, but more needs to be done. And we, as consumers, every day have an opportunity three times a day, seven days a week, to do something about that. So right now, I'd like to show you some um, examples, because we're at a creative morning. Oh, quickly just let you know that the good news is there is good news. 66% of consumers are willing to pay more uh, for sustainable products. And this is a global survey, 30,000 people, 60 countries, including Asia Pacific area. And to bring that a little bit closer to home, um, last year it was found that 24% of the Hong Kong population declared themselves flexitarian. So for those of you who don't know, flexitarian means by default we're happy to go meatless and perhaps just eat meat if cooked for someone, uh, by someone for us or as a special occasion, but generally meatless is the default. Uh, I, don't know, I count myself as one as well. Um, and now we have this blueprint for the first time in history of what a good diet is for human health and the planet. So this came out by the Eat Lancet Commission um, early this year. You'll see that meat and dairy does feature, but it's just a small amount. So we're at Creative Mornings. I'd like to highlight some creative solutions um, that I think are interesting. This I saw a few weeks ago, uh, addressing biodiversity by protecting our seeds. It's sort of funny that you have to build a vault in order to protect the seeds, but actually not that funny because it's a very serious issue. So right now, um, this vault has been built by the Norwegian government and a couple of NGOs have come together to realize that actually we need to protect our seeds because we're losing the variety. Um, you never know, we could have a climate disaster. So this vault is in the middle of nowhere. As you can see the blue dot there, hopefully only people are supposed to be entering there can get in. Um, secondly, I found this great poem, uh, Name to a Z, uh, by uh, Dan, who is, works at an NGO in the UK, Food Ethics Council. I thought it really, really nice way to sort of um, um, summarise some of the issues we're having around the food system. 
and what we need to do more of. So I just want to highlight a couple. I think um, he says A is for agency, and I think it's so true. We all have a role to play, and that as individuals, we can act and make changes in our lives. Um, and he says D is for diversity. And yes, we need diversity in our scenes, as we mentioned earlier on, and diversity in our workplaces, because I think that's how we learn and grow from one another. And you, he says, it's for urgency. The time is really now. So there's no delaying. We can all take action in one way or another. Um, I found this one really interesting because it brings in business. So there's a bank um, in Singapore who has uh, borrowed money to a farm and the, the interest rate, the money they pay back, is linked to how they perform on sustainability. So I thought that was really, really creative. A good um, way to show that business is an industry and, and that they can really do something too. It's not just the NGOs. Number four, I saw this on the BBC the other day. Some of you might have already seen it. Um, it's a Canadian uh, restaurant, Farmhouse Tavern. They sell out all of their food to avoid food waste. And they do that on the day before their off day. So they'll just sell it all out at half price or whatever price it is. So there's nothing wasted. And all restaurants and cafes can do this. You can also ask your local, favorite local to do this too. So what is Grassroots Pantry doing? Um, first of all, I have to update you. We are um, Grassroots Pantry no more. So uh, the last day of uh, business was on the 10th. And there's a picture of us on our last day. We are now um, Nectar Interpretive Dining. So we've moved away from casual up to sort of more of a higher end, and you like to say it's high end without the stuffiness. We're doing tasting menus, and I'll introduce a little bit about the tasting menus later. We're also uh, going to start this um, R&D lab, pollen lab, and it's going to be at the mills um, later in August. We'll launch there. It's a place where you and I, everybody can come and learn some plant-based re uh, recipes or to, you know, to learn about sustainability, a little bit of the things I've been talking about. And thirdly, consultancy, which is where a lot of my work will come in, to it's a space to really scale what restaurants in Hong Kong can do. We want to get Hong Kong restaurants on board. It could be waste, it could be single use plastic, but it's a holistic approach. And there's a picture of Paige, which is going to be speaking in October. She's speaking all the time. At the so what have we done? We put out our first sustainability report, um, and it's not your typical report, it's not loaded with lots of jargon and figures. It's actually like a magazine, we've made it really accessible so anyone can look at it. It, it, it contains lots of beautiful photographs, but it just traces the last 12 months of what we've done at the restaurant in terms of recycling, and we really try to benchmark because, as you know, what gets measured gets done, and that's the way we also want to help restaurants as well to see what we're doing, what suppliers we're using, to create real transparency in the space. Um, number two, last month we were recognized by the UN, the SDG team, for uh, as a best practice case study. So we really are sustainable, we're not just saying it. And, and uh, last, a few weeks ago we were at Fidelity doing a wellness week, they were interested in raw and organic. But uh, we don't just come and talk about raw and organic. We bring in all the other issues. For example, very subtly, uh, we brought some um, uh, banana muffins in that were made out of banana flour. So just to, to highlight this issue around food waste, you can use um, the skin of bananas to make banana muffins. This is the one I love the most. So this is Peggy's um, Earth Hour menu, and she's um, drawn inspiration from Project Drawdown. I don't know if any of you know Project Drawdown. It's um, 100 ways we can all um, reduce our carbon emissions. A uh, book came out a couple of years ago. And in the top 20, about eight of them are related to food. So she's drawn inspiration from the book, and um, these are basically her, her meals. Her, her dishes are physical representations of the problem. So if we look at plastic, plastic is a shimeji mushroom, and the, the dish is somehow created with all the ingredients. It, there's a, a transparent layer that sort of mimics plastic, but of course it's all edible. Everything is on there is edible, but it's just drawn inspiration from this kind of top 20 dishes. And it also creates conversation when people come into the restaurant. 
Um, number five, our three percent carbon tax. So she does away with the ten percent service charge, which a lot of restaurants charge. Instead, she puts three percent on, and that starts a lot of conversation, um, which is great. And Peggy's actually told me that they received more tips because of it. So the staff on the front of house have received more tips than they did before. So that's an interesting story too. The last thing I want to mention is um, Sustainable Restaurant Association, what gets me really excited about my job. Um, do you know the SRA? They are they're based in London and um, they help restaurants get on their sustainability journey. So it's a very strong methodology, three, uh, 10 years um, in the making, and they just launched in, um, in Asia, and we're trying to bring the SRA to Hong Kong. So their pillars are, three pillars are environment, people and um, sourcing. So very strong and the way they came up with their methodology was to work and collaborate with other NGOs. So single issue NGOs such as for example the Soil Association to figure out all, all the sustainability issues around soil health. And then with the WWF to figure out what a, what a healthy plate looks like for, for humans and the planet. So then what you get is a consensus of what sustainability really is and to adapt that to food service. And there's a picture of us um, at the World's 50 Best um, a few months ago, because the SRA do auditing for, for the restaurants that participate in the World's 50 Best. So we have dining awards, and we do these audits, for, it can be for plastic, it can be for waste, it can be for many other things. There's an online community where chefs and business owners can get together and ask each other questions such as how do I waste this food in a buffet situation. Um, so really strong methodology, we really want to bring it to Hong Kong, but, but uh, first we have to do research to make sure that this is uh, something that is, is um, wanted here. Another thing I wanted to draw your attention to is the oneplanetplate.org website. It's a place where you can go and find some really nice recipes, Chefs around the world have uploaded their ecological recipes. So if you cook, um, it's a great place for you to go visit and, um, and check that out. And you can also find restaurants around the world that care about sustainability too. And here we are, you can see the presence of, um, of a food made with an SRA around the world. And the real reason why I'm here is I really, really want you guys to help me with my survey. Um, to, to determine whether SRA um, is a good thing to bring to Hong Kong. We're trying to find out um, uh, from the public um, how much need there is for this, and we are in the feasibility testing stage. So what are my takeaways from today of uh, this being end? I, I think uh, you're talking about life journey, it's more about life stages, and I know ends and beginnings. Whereas if we're talking about um, end, um, sorry, food sustainability, yes, I do believe we're at the end of an um, era of ignorance of food's impact on health, planet, and animal welfare. And hopefully you are much more aware now, having um, come to this talk today. Um, what can you do about it? I'd like to say, be a conscious eater. Just think about what you're eating and place a bit more value on it. Don't just eat to live, it sounds like a cliche, but you know, live to eat and really consider all of those things that I mentioned earlier on. But also don't feel guilty. I live by an 80-20 rule myself. You know, you can't do everything at all times, as we mentioned earlier on. Your environment really plays a role in how sustainable you can be, whether it's food or other um, areas. But you could ask yourself, how do you, how do you know your footprint with every bite you take? And another thing, um, what we try to do at Grassroots um, is we embed sustainability in every decision and action we take. So I challenge you today to go for a meatless um, lunch. And if you are already doing that, maybe go for a meatless lunch tomorrow. If you're already doing that, when you go to the restaurant next time, um, ask about where your food is sourced. So you know, you see the, the issues around um, sustainability food sustainability, and there are many questions that you can ask to, to be more involved in this. So thank you, I'll just end it there, thank you.
First of all, thank you very much. Uh, I support everything you get here. Um, I have a question uh, why it is a grassroots appeal, for example, like that, but uh, a next is coming in place for it, if I understand it, well, and that's going to be more high end. So, have you guys also thought about something that's more accessible, that looks like the low level? That's a good question. I'm, I'm, Peggy's been asked a lot, and she normally answer that question. But I do believe um, so it's, it's twofold because right now, what Peggy's always been a leader in the space, right? And she was the first one to take this whole plant based in Hong Kong mainstream seven years ago. And she was at the forefront, so that felt great. But now, what's happened is it's become very mainstream. You've got lots and lots of other options in the area. Um, you have Mana, and you have um, a whole plethora of other options. And so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, you know, chefs, they grow, they learn, they perfect their craft. So she really finds the challenges, um, you know, creative challenges are much more fulfilling when you can go on to tasting menu. So it's more about an evolution rather than closing one chapter and then opening another. But you can come to um, Pollen Lab to be more, you know, you can come and learn about plant-based cooking there. Um, and for sure that there are many, many sort of casual um, options in farm base that I can tell you about if you need. So I'm an omnivore, but definitely lean towards carnivore. And rather than shifting to a majority plant-based diet, which I found very difficult uh, in terms of getting the density of proteins in the analysis that I want. Um, I'm open to ideas like the possible the beyond the I'm, I'm open to the idea of substituting traditional uh, agriculture farm animals with insect based diets, but I don't see a lot of I, well I didn't hear any of that mentioned in your presentation and I'm wondering whether or not it may be easier because some people they like me, but Absolutely. I prefer not to cause all the problems in the world that come from eating meat the way that we cultivated the slaughter animals today. But I, I I would prefer to have a an alternative to the paradigm but not abandon like my war period this whole thing. Good point. Um, and, you know, at grassroots, we don't um, judge. We don't say, you know, you shouldn't eat meat. But what we do is we focus on um, plant-based and whole foods, right? So that's um, maybe a reason I didn't mention uh, uh, Impossible and Beyond and all of those um, alternative proteins, because we really do focus on whole foods. Um, I think the alternatives are great in one sense, because, I mean, you have to think of them as what they are. They're burgers, right? So you wouldn't eat burgers five times a day and then going on the alternatives path. But my point about, um, I think the good thing about these alternatives is that they, they reduce the demand for livestock. So you're reducing the need to clear land, to grow grains, to um, for, um, deforestation, um, all those emissions. So on that sense, it's a good, it's a good thing. But you, you can't completely replace um, that use those alternatives, right? Uh, you wouldn't eat those every day. Um, so what what was it that that doesn't really so, answer your question? No, so so my issue is if you're trying to put sustainability, you, there's no one there's no one diet that fits everyone. Right? Absolutely. So I don't ever want to be a vegan. Right. I'll say that right now. Yeah. Um, but I <laughs> but I like to eat more responsibly. But yeah. I still want uh, uh, primarily meat they say. Yeah. So whether it's synthesized lab grown meat, which they're getting much closer to creating, yeah. um, uh, or a more realistic meat alternative derived from vegetable proteins, or yeah. um, an insect based diet. And it's not just about burgers. You know, you can eat bread made from uh, cricket flour, for example, or mealworms, things like that. There's, I think there's a great variety it, it, when you're talking about food diversity, it's not just plants. Yeah. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of meat alternatives that are not, you know, maybe looking for more meat. Um, but there's a lot of 
And this is a lot of barriers in terms of education, in terms of perception, in past, like, you know, the speech. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the perceived evidence factor of it. Um, I, but I didn't see any of that kind of in your presentation or in what the press or the vector kind of. So if you're going to educate about the full spectrum of sustainable food, yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's important to incorporate um, things like Sometimes babies or appealing to people like me who don't want a 70% of that discipline. And that's fair enough, but because we only um, promote whole foods, we, we're not experts, or we don't tend to be, and in trying to um, you know, discuss too much about what the alternatives can be given, we really try to stay nutrition focused and sort of, um, whole food focused. Um, does that answer the question? Did you really want to hear a bit more about crickets? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think I expect uh, any. Uh, I think they play. Um, so yeah, I think they play an important role for sure because. Um, whether you will eat them or not, I think they, you know, they play a part of the landscape. And um, crickets are a good example. Insects are a good example. I visited an insect farm in Amsterdam, uh, just outside of Amsterdam. It's a project, project for people. And um, they're using um, insects for animal meat, which is great. But I don't think in the Western world it's necessarily great for that. However, I think what you're talking about is culture, maybe, the culture of eating and how we're trying to change what's the norm. And I think it is very difficult, you know, um, we all have our habits, we all have our traditions of where we grew up, and especially in Hong Kong, you know, you have all the meat, the whole meat, other than the chicken and the duck in the window. You've grown up in Hong Kong, this is normal to you, so, you know, you question why it change. But we can't keep eating like our, our parents did, because we don't have that kind of resources, and we know that now, there's lots of evidence out there to help us make better choices. And also with me, as you know, the WHO in 2015 published their work about the, the issues around processed and, and red meat and um, high consumption of those are, are found to be linked to certain NCDs and cancers. So if you don't take the information, you know, and you don't use it, it's like, well, you might get sick, you might get um, uh, become unhealthy, you might get cancer. And I think this is an example from the UK, really. You know, what do you do when people voluntarily make themselves sick through eating and then they rely on the public health services to make them better again? You know, it's a, and it's a question. So at what point do you stop worrying about being in any state and trying to tell people what to eat? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. There's no silver bullet, that's for sure. Um, thanks so much for the talk. It's super interesting. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, first one is, I sometimes find it hard to know where to shop. So I like cooking, but I don't always know where I should go. Like sometimes I go somewhere and I find things that can't get on like three from far away. So I can't like, get on with good either. Um, that's my first question. And then the second question is, what do you think of food affecting our roots? Because I know, I know for example, if I have too much sugar, it will definitely have an impact on my mood. So I know that has an impact. But I think other types of food really impacts how it feels. So Absolutely. You know, what do you think of that? Um, so going back to the first question, um, sorry, I'll ask this question. So there's definitely a link between um, food and depression, for example. Uh, Mark Bristol um, in the UK, who is an ex-colleague at Forum, has written um, about this, or rather he highlighted it, but we can find um, articles, and a lot of Peggy's work is um, about that. You know, you might have seen, if you follow her on Instagram, um, she, we had a video out um, a few weeks ago talking about how um, food is healing, and it led her out of depression. So um, I agree, food definitely affects the way we feel, and your first question? Where do you oh, sure. Shop? And where yeah. Do and uh, we know that 97% of um, Hong Kong's food is imported. Well, I found out when I came here. But, um, so that's a really high number. We worry about 60% in the UK, while in Hong Kong it's much, much higher. So there are issues around trying to source food and then concerns about it being more expensive because it's organic. Um, 
on that note, I will say, think about what you spend on clothes and shoes and the rest of the things. Um, but on our um, uh, sustainability report, at the end there, we have a list of um, farmers that we use and source from and who do delivery boxes. And that's, what, that's how I get around it. I've always, in the last 10 years, I've only used um, farm boxes. And it's great because you don't have to waste energy going out to find food. It's delivered to you once a week. And you can get that on rotation. So you never even have to, if you're not concerned about having specific items, you could get a seasonal box, which is what I do. And it helps you figure out, too, learn about different ingredients and, and forces you, well, Google's great. Just Google everything these days and find out. And once I had a, a, a turn for something, I didn't know what to do with it. And I Googled it and I found it. So there are ways you can figure it out, but uh, the farm box is a good idea. And of course, I can help you with um, resources and then. And with Green Queen, you know, she has all those, um, she's a great website, very uh, useful. Right, we have time for one last question. Hi, uh, and so thanks for the questions and and talks. And I'm just curious. So, um, for graduate initiatives, I just wonder if you work on a uh, on an approach or a top up approach to work with uh, like um, government, uh, FHED, or what was just that like. Um, a social media to encourage people on the consumer level to encourage the, to people vegan to go vegan. So I just wonder what kind of approach you guys Well, have. Um, we're very inclusive. Um, so if you check out the sustainability report, you'll see that we've had um, about 175 interns come through our doors. We've had a lot of um, school kids come visit because we have a digester and they're interested in how food at least is managed at the restaurant. Uh, we worked uh, with obviously CSR, lots of corporates. Uh, through the Sustainable Restaurant Association model, hopefully we'll also work with academics and government. Because we really need everyone on board. It's not something we can do on our own. It's really a, a collaborative effort. And, and so, in other questions, so if you guys um, would like to work with companies like that, like insurance company like AIA, Metalite? Yeah, we, we already do in terms of um, offering wellness programs. And um, Sudan and Pollen Lab is open, which we have to do a lot more. So that's what Pollen Lab is. It's more um, of an organized structure because Pink's have been doing this for seven years already. It's just that they've been more ad hoc. And in this way, we have a space that's dedicated for working with NGOs, industry, and businesses. Otherwise, they have a new talent editor, uh, insurance app, because they just encourage us to protect, like, head up the staff day for, like, a certain period of time so we can get. Free movie tickets, so big it is, and I'll charge. <laughs> no, we don't give any freebies away, but we do do a lot of talks <laughs> and, and give our time to do um, talks. Um, so. All right, well, thank you very much, Heidi. For that.